Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us today at New City Church. I don't know, most of you are probably like this. When you ask for directions or when you're trying to get somewhere, you don't really want someone to give you the directions. You just want them to give you the address so that you can put in your phone. And depending on your generation and how old you are is how comfortable you are with that. Uh, I think if you're a little bit on the younger side, you might have people in your life, maybe your grandparents, who when you need to go somewhere, instead of giving you just the uh, address, they also try to tell you where to go. Now, if, that's, if you're the type of person, props, I get it, before GPS and all that sort of thing, it was really helpful for people to tell you how to get there, the shortcuts. And then, you know, when the GPS came out, you know, it was kind of clunky, it didn't always work, and so there's some reservation now, uh, there is some reservation there, but just so that we're all on the same page, the GPS is always better than someone giving you directions, right? Now it's got weather. <laughs> It's got road conditions. It can tell you if there's an accident, right? And so there's these sometimes if someone continues, you know, depending on how nice you are, if you're nice, you'll listen. If you're like me, you're like, I don't, I'm not going to listen to where you tell me to go. Just give me the address, right? Because here's what we want to do, right? We want to give directions. We want to be helpful. But again, the GPS at this point in time is always the better way. Right? And, and today, as we continue our series through the Gospel of Mark, we're going to see the disciples interact with Jesus in this same manner. They are like us, if we're not careful, where we try to tell Jesus the directions of where we're supposed to go and how he is supposed to operate, as opposed to letting him, I know this is a cliche, maybe example, but allowing him to be the GPS because he happens to always be right. And so today, if you have a Bible, we'll be in Mark chapter 8. We're going to see this interaction with Jesus and his disciples. If you don't have a Bible, there's a black one around you. And if you do not own a Bible, you can take one of those black ones home. It is our gift to you. Um, If you were here last week, the last passage we read where Jesus fed the 5,000, not to be confused with the feeding of, or sorry, the 4,000, not to be confused with the feeding of the 5,000. And then Jesus and his disciples have this problem where the disciples are are, are wondering where their next meal is going to come from, which is perfectly a legitimate worry. The problem is they are failing to understand and to see that Jesus can be trusted. And so we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, looking at the life of Jesus, and today we're going to pick up the story, starting in chapter 8, verse 22, and here is what it says. It says, they, which is Jesus and his disciples, came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So the people there brought a blind man to Jesus, wanting Jesus to heal him. He, being Jesus, took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. Spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking. Verse 25, again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. The man looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Then Jesus, he sent him home, the blind man who has been healed, saying, don't even go into the village. So again, what's happening here is after the feeding of the 4,000, the disciples are around Jesus and Jesus kind of uh, rebukes them and tells him how they still don't, he kind of asks this question, how do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not understand that I can be trusted? And then right after that exchange, Mark shows us this miracle who heals a man who cannot see, right? Mark is intentionally linking this to the previous passage that Jesus can be trusted. Now, again, we also know this, uh, that Jesus doesn't have to perform any sort of ritual act to heal people. So the question is, what is going on here? In fact, we've seen Jesus heal people who weren't even in close proximity to him. Uh, And so what we see happening here is this miracle that Jesus is doing is likely symbolic of what he is trying to teach his disciples and actually what is soon about to happen. See, because the disciples and the people following Jesus are having a hard time fully seeing and understanding Jesus for who he actually is. And in the next verses we're going to read here, they for the first time are going to claim that Jesus is actually the Messiah but they're not going to fully comprehend all that that means and the, and the reality that he also has to suffer. And so in the same way, this miracle, uh, Jesus heals this man uh, in partiality, but then eventually he sees clearly, but not at first. And that's exactly where the disciples find themselves. And so here's what happens next. Verse 27, it says this. Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? 
And so Jesus, again, they're in Bethsaida. It's kind of the North Shore area of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, now they are walking to Caesarea Philippi. It is about a 25-mile journey. It uh, typically took you about two days to get there. And so as they're walking, they're talking. And Jesus asks his disciples, who do people, who, what have you heard? Who do people say? Who do people think that I am? And so here's their response, verse 28. They answered him, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets, right? These are the, and generally speaking, the things that they are hearing a lot about who people think Jesus is. Some people thought he was John the Baptist. We actually read this a little bit earlier in Mark, where Herod, who is kind of the governor of this area, actually has John the Baptist beheaded. But of course, Jesus is walking around performing all these miracles. So some people think John the Baptist has somehow come back to life and doing all these crazy things. Other people think that this, that Jesus is Elijah, now, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet. What's interesting is that there was a, a very big uh, speculation or rather a fascination with the prophet Elijah in ancient Judaism. Now, it's not necessarily because what Elijah did for his accomplishes were not as great or maybe as well known as Abraham or Moses or David or some of these other big Old Testament figures. The reason why there's such a fascination with Elijah is for two reasons. One, for how he died. In 2 Kings chapter 2, it says he was taken up into heaven. And secondly, that he is supposed to play, Elijah the prophet is supposed to play some sort of role before God comes back to redeem and to judge the world. Now, we know in Mark chapter 1 that the Mark links the Elijah-like figure to actually be John the Baptist, that John the Baptist is the Elijah-like figure who has come to announce that the Lord, that God, is here. And so some people think that this is Elijah, that he's doing all these crazy things because, you know, God's judgment is close at hand. Or the lastly, kind of the third group is a prophet, right? Maybe this is a kind of general catch-all. People don't exactly know what to do with Jesus, but he knows that they know that he's done a lot of crazy stuff. He's really well known. There's crowds everywhere he goes. Maybe we could, in modern uh, words, we could throw in our, maybe a good moral teacher. Uh, that's a, maybe a common phrase that you might hear today. Um, as a side note, that's just very interesting to say, especially with what we're going to read here in just a second, that yes, Jesus says some really great, some really loving, some really kind things. Uh, but if Jesus isn't who he says that he is, if you want to put modern day language, and I think on how you can accurately describe Jesus, is that if he is isn't the son of God, if he isn't the one who defeated sin and death by dying and raising on the cross, you would not call him a good moral teacher. You would call him a master manipulative abuser for what he claims about himself, that he lied and he tricked everyone to think of him as someone that he actually wasn't. Jesus is not who he claims to be. Calling him a good person, I do not think is one of the categories for us, but that's a general one. Now, of course, we know, if you read the Gospel of Mark, as we've been doing, all of these descriptions are inadequate, right? That Mark shows us that Jesus can't be defined as anyone else than of God and sent by God. We've seen the miracles he's performed and the things that he has said, and he is constantly uh, referring and fulfilling things throughout the Hebrew Bible or in the Old Testament, uh, saying he is the one who has done all of these things. He's supposed to be God himself. And so now Jesus is going to ask his disciples, who do they think Jesus is? And so we'll continue reading John chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 29. Here's what happens next. It says this. But you, he asked them, so Jesus is asking his disciples here, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, Peter, one of the disciples, really the leading the disciple, he answered him by saying, you are the Messiah, and he, being Jesus, strictly told them, his disciples, to tell no one about him. Now, here's the deal, right? Peter's answer here sounds really good, right? It's like, yeah, you got it right. He actually is the disciple. In fact, up until now, in the gospel of uh, Mark, uh, no human being has actually accurately described who Jesus is. Right? The only people that have said that this is actually the Son of God are the demons at times when God, when Jesus healed people, that they recognized him for who he was, but no one else yet into the Gospel of Mark has, has accurately identified Jesus until this point. But this, and this, so this sounds really good. He says that you are the Messiah. Uh, some translation says you are the Christ, which just means he is the anointed one. So Messiah is a Hebrew word meaning anointed one. Christ is the Greek word being the anointed one, that you are the anointed one. 
Now, here's what this means. So for ancient Jews, what this meant is that the anointed one, the Messiah or the Christ, was the one who was going to come and redeem God's people, overthrow their oppressors, so overthrow whatever governing uh, nation is ruling them at the time. At this point, it's the Roman Empire, and liberate his people. Of course, the assumption is by force, because how else would you overthrow an evil regime? But by, by amassing your own army and your own military to overthrow them, and then eventually create an everlasting kingdom of peace on earth. This is what the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, is supposed to do. Uh, This may be why Jesus commands silence here, because again, we're going to see they don't fully understand what it actually means to be the Messiah, right? Like the blind man, Peter's assessment, likely the rest of the disciples' assessment, uh, is initially incomplete. He is the Messiah, but he's not going to do what you assume he is going to do. Right? And here's what he's going to do. It says this in verse 31, chapter 8. It says, Then he, being Jesus, began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. So again, if you remember, Son of Man is the primary title Jesus gives himself throughout the book of Mark and all of the Gospels. Uh, We're not going to get into all of it here, but Son of Man can essentially mean one of two things. It can simply be a person, just any any human being, any man is a son of of man. Or in the Old Testament of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a dream where, long story short, you have a divine messianic figure who comes with the angels to make everything right. Right, and this is Jesus is claiming to be this son of man, this divine figure who has come to do for us what we cannot yet do for ourself. The problem is he also then says that he has to suffer. Right? That which to them wouldn't make sense. Now, for us, if you are somewhat familiar with the Bible, if you are a follower of Jesus, to us, this makes a lot of sense, right? That that Jesus has to suffer. Uh, to them, this would be particularly confusing. Because, again, how are you supposed to suffer if you're going to be king? Uh, Maybe one of the reasons that we assume that it should be obvious is that Jesus later on will refer many times or he will identify himself with the suffering servant uh, that you can read about in the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, you have various chapters that talk about the servant of the Lord who is going to suffer. The problem is ancient Jews never associated the suffering servant in Isaiah before Jesus to the Messiah until Jesus came. And the reality is, how could they? Right? Because to them, how are you going to suffer if you are supposed to be king? And on top of all of that, what does Jesus say here? That it will happen from his own people. His own people will hand him over to suffer and die. How in the world, again, is the anointed Messiah going to be not only die, but be handed over by his own people if he is actually supposed to rule? This does not make sense. And then it says this, verse 32, says, he spoke openly about this. So Jesus is now going to explain to his disciples how all of this is supposed to play out. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Verse 33, but turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So Jesus rebukes Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. So this is interesting. Jesus openly and plainly is trying to explain to his disciples what is going to happen to him. He's not using a parable. He's not using teaching that's kind of confusing, that needs extra uh, extra explanation later on, that he is clearly communicating to them all that must happen. And how does they respond? Right? Peter responds how all of us likely would or felt in that situation. Right? He says, well, this is not possible. And not only that, there's likely this assumption that we won't let this happen. That if people come against you and try to fight you and try to harm you, we will, we will not let this happen. We have a lot of, there's a lot of crowds, there's a lot of people that like you. Like we will do whatever it takes to make sure you stay safe and to make sure that you can one day become king. But the disciples don't understand. Now, the question is why? Again, we have the benefit of reading the gospel stories, understanding that Jesus called himself the suffering servant, but they didn't. But even then, it's like, well, he says this enough. He's explained it plainly. How do they not understand that he actually has to suffer and die? Well, a couple weeks ago, I was reading a book, and they mentioned this study that happened that uh, basically unsurprisingly you know, pointed out that you and I, as you probably can guess, are predisposed to believe simply what we want to see 
in what we want to believe, even in the midst of evidence that might be leading us to the contrary. So there was this old study done, I think it was about 50 or 60 years ago, I wasn't quite sure how long ago it was, but they essentially put on these, uh, these I don't know what we call it, projector goggles, I guess the best way to explain it. There was a really fancy word that I had no idea how to pronounce, and it was like this massive machine. Uh, but maybe if it was happening today, think of like VR goggles. You just put goggles on, and they showed people two competing images in each eye at the same time. <laughs> and so what the researcher did was he grabbed a bunch of, grab, he invited a bunch of uh, people, Amer- people that were born in America and were adults and a, and a bunch of Mexican Americans that were born in Mexico, but at some point in their life immigrated to the United States. And what he did is he showed both groups of people the same image. On one eye, there was a baseball player. On the other eye, uh, there was a bullfighter. Now, again, this is 50, 60 years ago, so <laughs> I didn't make up this study, um, right? And so very typical, stereotypical things, American baseball, uh, Mexican bullfighter, right? And what happened? happened was the, almost all of the people in both groups, almost all of the people born in America uh, first noticed the baseball player, and most all people that were born in Mexico, first thing they saw, they noticed was the bullfighter. Yet they were both shown the exact things at the same time, right? It shows us that you and I tend to see what we are trained to see. And for Peter and the disciples here, he essentially sees Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah in one eye, and then he sees suffering and death in the other eye, and he knows, well, it can't be suffering and death, and so because the Messiah can't do that, he must be one of power and glory. And I think one of the things that Mark is showing us here, one of the things that the disciples are learning is this, and that is that saying that Jesus is Lord is not the same thing as following him. It's not the same thing, right? A disciple, a follower of Jesus, in other words, must get more than his title right, right? He or she must actually follow him in the unknown, in the areas that don't make a lot of sense, and maybe in the areas that you wish were not true, but actually are true, right? What the disciples were suffering from here, I learned this term this week just randomly. I wasn't looking it up, but it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, The Dunning-Kruger effect is when you and I think we know a lot more about a situation or a lot more about something, a subject, than we actually do. Now, many of us, you might say, there are people in our lives who seem to suffer the Dunning-Kruger effect about everything, right? They always have an answer, right? If you're like, well, I don't really know anyone like that, you might be the one, okay? Uh, But there's people who like, no matter what the question is, they have an answer. I remember one of my best friends in college, one of my roommates, he's a great guy. He also did this very often. All the time, he would have an answer for stuff that he had no idea. And I'm like, bro, just say you don't know or just don't answer. The, like, even if it's like not being talked to him, he, he's just there. He's like, well, let me tell you, right? And I, I'll never forget, there was a sophomore year in college. We were in, our, uh, we were in our apartment and he was talking to this girl who he had a crush on at the time. And they were talking about music theory, which I'm like, <laughs> I don't know that that's the best way to pick, pick, pick people up. I don't know if that's your thing, but I'm like, this obviously why this never worked out as he's trying to like woohoo with music theory, right? So for me, I grew up playing the piano. I originally went to college as a music major. He played the saxophone. So he knew about music, not, not, not quite as much as I did, but that doesn't matter. And so he's talking. I don't, know, I don't know what it was, but he was just wrong. Like, he was just wrong. And I'm like, I'm like laughing and also not going to say anything because I'm not ruining his chances. Maybe I should have to be like, bro, she don't care about music theory, right? She don't care about sharps and flaps and flats and what those things mean, right? But he's just, he did it all the time when he had no idea what he's talking about. And so Jesus here rebukes Peter because his concerns are human. It's not that his desires aren't in the right place. It's not that he doesn't care about Jesus, but he has no idea what he is saying that we're not going to let this happen to you. He has no idea that Jesus must do this so that he can stand in our place and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. What's happening here is Peter's telling Jesus what Peter wants to see happen, and Jesus is telling Peter, you have no idea what you're actually trying to prevent. And if you did, you wouldn't be saying these things. And then he says this next in verse 34. It says, calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. 
So it says, calling the crowd. Very often, Jesus did not just travel with his 12 disciples from place to place. There are other people that followed them, that supported them. And so from walking from uh, Bethsaida to Caesarea Philippi, there's a big group of people. And so after this exchange just with his disciples, he opens it up to everyone that is with him to explain what he's trying to say here. Right, that after foretelling his own death, his own suffering, why it must happen, he then instructs all people who want to follow him that they must also take up their own cross. Now, for us, again, it's, I think it's really hard for us to understand how repulsive a statement this was for these people. Right? For us, again, you're used to seeing cross necklaces. We've heard this before. If you're following Jesus, this is not a, maybe a new text for you. And so it's like, yeah, you know, deny yourself, deny your life, of course, follow Jesus. For them, this would have made... No sense, right? Because the cross was public torture. It was death and it was humiliation, not just for you, but for your entire family, right? And so what he says is that those who want to find me and follow me and actually experience life must give up their life like that. Why? Why do do you do this in such a drastic way so that they can actually find life? Your desires and what you want is not going to lead you to where you want to go, but following Jesus is. Our screens have been messing up today. It's not their fault, so we'll keep going here. Here's what's happening here. Uh, the, the word life here that Jesus said is the Greek word psyche. It's where we get psychology and all these various things. But it connotes not just your physical existence. What Jesus is talking about here is also really your personhood or your whole being or your soul. And so what Jesus is saying here is that you want to follow me, you have to give up everything. You need to lay it down, but if you do it, you will find life. Now, what's interesting, in not all cases, but in the majority of time throughout Scripture, when Scripture talks about life, it's not necessarily talking about how long you're going to live. It's talking about the quality of life you will experience. It's not necessarily saying that if you honor God with your life, you'll get all the stuff that you want. But that if you walk in the wisdom of the Lord, uh, you'll experience grace and forgiveness and love and mercy, and you'll be able to walk through difficult situations in life with more joy and, and contentment than you otherwise would. And so for Jesus here, what he's telling his disciples is that following him is not something that you can compartmentalize. For our case, it doesn't just happen on Sunday or just when you may feel bad and you need something from God, but that Jesus is Lord over all areas of our life that we should consider him in all things, right? And so maybe a modern day example, what this can look like is like, not just the things that we like, like this idea of loving others and giving grace and forgiveness and compassion. Like those are things that our culture would say, yes, we should, you know, we should emulate, but also the things that challenge us. And it's different for different cultures. Uh, For us, maybe it's God's design for sex and sexuality, right? Or actually praying for your enemies and caring for them, right? When was the last time, me included, that someone who made you really mad, your first response is, I'm going to pray for their goodness and for God to, to reveal his love in their life. Right? That's not our normal response. But he's challenging us to not do what we would want, but what he would want for his glory and our good. And so I just want to lay this before you as we talk about life and following Jesus. Here's the reality. That following Jesus is hard. It's hard. Right, especially in your own power or especially out of obligation. If you feel like you have to for God to love you or to gain his favor or because it's just the right thing to do, it is really hard. It is really hard to forgive somebody who's deeply wounded you. It is really hard to have your first thought be, how can I love and care for people that I disagree with instead of just think of all the ways why they are wrong? It is really hard to be generous with your finances or your time or to do things that you don't want to do for the benefit of other people. Following Jesus is hard, Particular in the, particularly in the moment. There are many times where it's not, it is not the easy choice. And so the question that we ask ourselves is, why should we do it? Why should we follow Jesus and give him his life if it can be so difficult? I, I like this quote by C.S. Lewis. It'll be on the screen. We, we've shared it from time to time before, but he puts it this way. Here's his answer as to why we should follow Jesus, even in the hard stuff. It says this, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, When infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased that we don't actually understand the life that Christ offers us. And listen, this is not just the life to come in his kingdom where there's no more pain, suffering, and death, which is true, but it's also life here. 
Or put another way, I think well, here's what Jesus is inviting us into. Right? Here's, here's the thing for us, right? We often just want to survive. Jesus wants us to live. Right, we want to make it to the next day, the next week, the next paycheck, the next thing. But Jesus wants to offer us life. Now, life and freedom often comes through hardship and dif- discipline and difficulty. It often comes from not doing what you might want to do in the moment for some greater good in the future. And this is what the way of Jesus is. It can often be hard and not what our initial inclination can be, but it is the road to life. And again, not just in the future, but also now. That is, he, we want to survive to the next thing. He wants to offer us life. He wants us to live. And I can't help but think of something we say here often at New City Church that encapsulates this perfectly. Here's what we say often at New City, that if you're in Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress. Right? In Jesus, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress. This is freedom. Right, that you don't have to go around uh, proving yourself to other people or thinking it is all about you. Right? What does our culture tell us? It's all it's you, 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 you. Right? You've got to find yourself as if you can somehow find yourself. I don't know what that actually means. Right? Or you need to uh, write your own powerful story as if you have all the ability to do all these amazing things. And if you somehow fall short, it is all on you. Again, finding yourself as if you somehow like how do you know if you've actually done that? Right? It is actually crippling. Because it's all up to you, and you have no idea. You have no barometer to know if you've actually done it. But what does Jesus say? It's not up to you. It's up to me. And in me, you have the forgiveness of life. You have grace. You have mercy. You have nothing to prove, and so you don't have to go around trying to puff yourself up or try to look good in front of other people because the God of the universe redeems you through Christ, and you have no one to impress because if you are in Jesus, Jesus has done for you and for me in his life, death, burial, and resurrection that we could, what we could not do for ourselves, that God looks at you and me the same way that he looks at Christ, which is righteous and blameless and whole. Right? This is the gospel, that Jesus doesn't just ask us to lay ourselves down, that he actually does it himself. He is the example for us. He is the redeemer who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That he is telling his disciples that I am going to suffer and die, not for my sake, but for yours. And if you are in me, and if you follow the way that I am leading you, it can be hard, it can be difficult, it, but it is worth it because it is freeing, because you have nothing to prove and no one to impress if you are following me. And then he says this in verse 38, chapter 8. He continues by saying, For whoever is ashamed of me, right, who doesn't want to give their life up for me but wants to go their own way, whoever is ashamed of me in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, interestingly here, this thing about being ashamed is he's specifically talking about what's going to happen to him, that he is going to suffer a shameful and publicly humiliating death. And if you are still ashamed to follow me, if you still want to reject me, you will not, he, Jesus will not force himself upon us, but he will also allow us to go our own way when he does come a second time to invite all who have followed him into his kingdom, right? This is why the apostle Paul in first Corinthians chapter one, it'll be on the screen. He also says this, it says, for the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet those who are called, anyone who is a follower of Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now, Paul here is not saying that that God or Jesus is unwise or foolish. What he's saying is that God uses things that we think are foolish and powerless to demonstrate his glory. In this text, he says the Jews demand a sign. We've seen that in Mark, that Jesus would somehow prove himself in the way that they describe or they think is adequate through signs and miracles. And yet a Messiah that's crucified, that's cursed, that's hung on a tree... There's no way an ancient Jew would want to voluntarily associate with that. Or the Gentiles, everyone else in the ancient world, what do you want? You want wisdom and you want power. And dying on a cross, that humiliating in a fashion, does not equal wisdom and power. 
Yet God is going to use what we consider to be foolish, to shame those who think they are wise, to demonstrate his power and his glory. The disciples, just like us, want a a suffering Messiah? Of course not. Right? We want a Messiah who's powerful and who has glory and who has majesty and looks really good. But you will not find it without following the king and the way that he has demonstrated it for us. And this is why the last verse we read, verse 1 of chapter 9, Jesus then finishes this passage by saying this. Then he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they sing them, say they see the kingdom of God come in power. So you're ashamed of what's, uh, what I'm going to do, but I'm going to show you the power of God in it. Now, this statement here is difficult, obviously, because all who physically heard this, Jesus' utterances here, did die. Right? This happened a long time ago. They are no longer around. So the question is, what is Jesus trying to say here? Well, it seems, given that, given that situation, that Jesus is likely trying to tell them they actually will see the, king, the power of the kingdom of God in their lifetime. And they're going to see it when he displays his power and glory over sin and death when he resurrects from, uh, from the cross three days later. And this is why he's inviting them to follow him. That he's going to do, things are going to happen to him that are, not, uh, that are shameful, that are embarrassing, that you would not think fit for a king. But he's going to do that so that we might experience life. And I think what he's trying to tell the disciples here, what Mark is trying to to, uh, communicate to us as he shares this story is this, that life is found in following the king, not wanting the king to follow you. That's where we find life, that the supreme wisdom and glory and power of God who knows all, who sees all, who knows more things than we could ever seek or ask or imagine or comprehend is leading us to life, the difficulties and the hardships of life. It's just like we mentioned earlier with the GPS. We're all walking around trying to give people directions when Jesus is just saying, follow me. Even if I'm leading you somewhere where you're not quite sure why you're going this way, or I'm taking you on a detour and you don't understand why that this is happening to you, he's saying, come and follow me. Don't follow your expectations. Don't follow what you think is supposed to happen, but follow me so that you can experience life. And listen, in this life, That can be hard. Again, there are so many times where we have to do things, where we're invited to do things that might not be our natural inclination, or there are so many times where we have doubts and confusions and anger and heartache over things that are happening in our life, and we don't understand why God would allow it or why God is doing certain things. But again, the reminder here is that if you want to find life, it's not about you making your own path and inviting Jesus to come along to do the things that you want to do, but it's about laying down your life and your desires so that the king can actually give you true life that cannot be found anywhere else. And listen, you know it, and I know it, that we're always chasing things to make us feel better, to make us feel good, to make us content, and it never, ever lasts. But Jesus has come to lay down his life in the most humiliating way, in a way that is completely unfit for a king to invite us in. That no matter who you are or what you have done, or what has been done to you. The perfect Messiah has come. The anointed one has come to give up his life as a ransom for us. That he is taking the penalty of sin and death and darkness so that we might be invited into his kingdom, not because of our power, but because of his. Life is found in in following the king and his desires, not in following your own. But the first thing that you and I must do is experience the grace and the mercy of the gospel and and ask God through the power of his spirit to transfer our hearts and desires so that we can live in a way that as many people in our community, in our sphere of influence, in our workplaces, in our families, in our friends might also experience the grace and mercy of God. Following Jesus can be really difficult, but it is more than worth it when you realize that God has come to lay his life down for you. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.